Good afternoon everyone, or good morning. As Sarah says, my name is Douglas Bell, I'm the BIM lead for IES. Uh, on daily I work within consultancy and within development with IES delivering projects. What I'd like to do first off is just, uh, I'm not going to go into full detail about it, it's just to reiterate uh, some key points with regarding BIM. Um, the, the main one is that, um, you may have heard it before or not, but BIM is not a software. Softwares are just the tools that help you achieve building information modelling. Along and to do that, you need the standards within the the building information modelling guidelines, such as the PAS 1192 uh, information delivery cycle diagram you have here. And it ultimately, it's the the standards, the methods, and procedures, and the people. The the people are the key part of it all. These need to be in place, and everybody needs to be on the same page to make it all work. If you don't, that's when uh, it will all fall down. So as you can see here, the, as I say, the, the information delivery cycle, it, if you're going to include energy and carbon throughout the life cycle of the uh, the design and operation of the, the asset or assets, you need to have it included in the plan to do so. And, and that's key to what we're, we're here to talk about today is actually having all this in place so that when you actually come to stage one or stage 100 and 200 you actually have thought about how you're going to react, interact with all the other teams within the design process and making sure that everything fits together nicely. Um, obviously in future as digital technology advances this will become even better um, but at the moment we're, we've got this, we've got uh, in the UK specifically, we've got the BIM Level 2 Guidance Suite, uh, which has got PAS 1192, uh, PAS 1193 and so on, and all these documents that help pull it all together. Um, but as I say, when it comes to energy and carbon, all, all, all this is vital. One of the key things that, that makes it as well is the level of detail with uh, and the level of information that you have at each stage of the design process as you go through. Um, it's often been described as like baking a cake. You build up the layers as you go through so you don't have too much information at the wrong time. And that again is it's another key uh, part of actually being able to, to use information from one package to another, um, no matter what it is. So if you want any more information, I'm sure you'll be aware you've heard of PAS 1192 and 3 and the soft landings documentation. These are just pieces and extracts out of these documents that you can read at your leisure. So first off, I'll just chat about um, with clients' models that we've had in. We still have the, the issue of actually the setting up the geometry. Um, and bringing that across to the virtual environment. Um, I won't go into too much detail on it. Jong is going to cover a lot more detail on that than myself. But uh, it's just to say that the, the key part of it when it comes to actually, say if you're using uh, the likes of Revit or Archicad, that you're actually detailing it out. You've got spaces and rooms in every area of your model. Um, we'll have a look at a Revit model. I'll have an example in a demo coming up. Um, but yeah, the main thing is to have no air gaps within that model. You need to make sure that every riser, every ceiling void, every stairwell has a room or a space and is accounted for. And you would just think of it, if you don't have that information there, it won't be accounted for in the quantity schedules, etc. So it's the same with energy modelling. You need to have that information there or it will be excluded from the analysis. So the next point um, that we looked at, it was we ha had a few models come in, and one of the key points that was making the import not transfer properly was just the actual user preferences within the virtual environment. Now, these have been put in primarily to allow the user um, to choose what to do. Previously, it was all done in the background, but now we let the users have a play about with that. Um, some might think that's not a good idea, but it, it is good to have you to allow the, the 
the choice of actually how you control the software and the import. Um, in the, some of these uh, test cases that we had and where, where we were helping clients out, we found that these settings in particular, say the attempt to fix shell surface orientation, that was ticked off. It's a one thing. It's obviously for in a um, package like say Revit or Archicad, the surface orientation doesn't really matter too much. Um, but when it comes across to a thermal package it, like IES, it does matter. Where the obviously the inside surface and the external surface, which way that is facing, is key for your analysis. So it's a good idea to go into your. Uh, user preferences within uh, the model it package and tools preferences shell import and you can check check these if you need any more information that you can check uh, online for that in our white paper there's also the other options that were set at too low where the attempt attempt to uh, uh, tidy and healing number of edges and healing number of surfaces within the geometry. If that, these two options where you can see it's set at 5,000 at the moment, if these are set too low, then if you, in particular where you've got complex or curved geometry, the software will just truncate it and square off the geometry. So it won't bring it across as you would expect. So if that's the, the, the case, you would just increase these values. Um, of course, I've got it set here at 5,000. If you had one zone with 5,000 surfaces on it, your simulations might be really slow if you had any more zones involved. But uh, So you could go ahead and have a look at that. There's also a, a five, a B, option B and option C that we've got in there. Option B is to extrude from the, the footprint of the zone if uh, it can't actually tidy up uh, the surfaces because the it's generally going to be the geometry is very complex in this scenario. And if it can't do any of those, it'll just it'll bring it in so you can see it. So you'll at least see the geometry. Before we used to it we used to throw the geometry out and you wouldn't ha actually see what was going on. So that's the, the actual a recap on the set import settings. Um, so I see if you need any more information on these, we can you can get that online uh, through our white papers or our user guides. So. Moving on to uh, enhancements that we're looking to do, Sarah's just touched on, we're looking to create a, a new navigator so that it, everything's more transparent and easier to find in the one place. In particular, user preferences like this shell import information, we're also looking to see if we can put that into, we're going to put that into our plugin as well, so you won't have to go into the, the virtual environment to find it. You'll just find it easily within the plugin, you can set it there and much uh, simpler process. We're also, in addition to all this, we're uh, all, the, all the time we're trying to improve the algorithms. In particular now it's for more complex geometry, just to see if we can ease that process as well. Um, to... So the, the next kind of key findings that we had were running through one of our clients came to us and actually wanted to find out if they could actually tag constructions. Um, they weren't actually wanting any data across with that, but they just wanted to have that. She'll be able to find it when it transferred to the virtual environment, find that um, construction easily. You can see the, the image of the model that they were working with. It's a sizable model, to say the least. I think it was about 2,000 zones. So for them to go back and try and assign different constructions internally, um, it would have taken a long time just to sort that out, rather than just dragging that information out. The, um, in this case, it was a Revit model. So, so we'll just go through. What we'll do is run through the the slides here, just talking through the steps, and then I'll go through the a demo of the the, exact, the same steps. So the first thing you need to do is when you go to your, once you've obviously set your model up correctly, is go to your uh, export settings within Revit, in this case, and check the export default values. Uh, it might kind of sound backward to do that, but you need to tick this on to actually 
take out the data from the model, the Revit model itself, and this is not going to be your default analytical constructions, just to make a note of that. So what the, the next step you need to carry out in the same dialogue is go into the constructions options and switch off the override tags there. This, if you don't do this, you'll end up taking these analytical constructions that you can see here. And the VE will, the track will map to these, but it's obviously not the data you're wanting. And you also, you won't tag the constructions doing this. So the final step is to actually go into your Revit model. And again, we'll, we'll go to show you this in a couple of minutes. So you can go into the Revit model and into the basic build-up of the construction. Once you go in there, you can actually check on the materials and trigger the thermal tab within the construction, within Revit. This, um, there is another tab there as well that you can trigger, but the, the main one's the thermal attribute. Once you've triggered this, it allows you to take across tagged construction information. So you can see here I've set up the family, it's in the basic wall family, and the, uh, the t I've named it an IES sim partition. Obviously you can give it any name that you wish. So when you come across to the virtual environment, you can see there I've gone into my a, a patchy area of the software, and you can select the construction assignment and see that you've got this IES sim partition has come across. So when you're doing this, you can tag any kind of geometry that you, uh, any of the constructions that you want. And it, once the key thing here is that it will make it easy to locate the, the constructions once you're in the virtual environment. So we're just going to change over to my demonstration model here, just a quite a, a basic office building, and we'll just quickly go to the ground floor plan and you can see here just point to note that you can see that I've got, because I'm using Revit MEP I have a space placed throughout the model so all the risers and um, ceiling voids if I just go to the section here you can see absolutely everywhere in the model has a space placed so there's no air gaps anywhere at all so basically we've, we've got no missing data in this case, or a, a room or a space missing at all. So what we want to do, so I mentioned we tagged a construction, so if I just select this wall here, and we go to the properties dialog, you can see it's set at uh, one type of uh, basic default partition within Revit. So what I can do is just go to the edit type option, and I'm just going to, within here, I'm just going to see, it's the type that I want to just duplicate. I'm just going to call this IES partition 1. And I'll just OK that. The other point to note while you're in here is just go in and check that the thermal data has been triggered. So you can go in here, see that the values are there. I always double check that you have this thermal tab within the materials library triggered. So you do that once and that's it set up and ready to go. So we'll OK that and we'll OK this and come out of here. So you can see now I have my wall partition, if I just select another wall, it's a different type and our wall here is set as our IES partition one. So we're all ready to go. So if I just save this, that's it saved. I now go to export GBXML. So as we looked at in the, the slides, we have our export default use ticked on. And we need to go to our building constructions and make sure the override check option is off. If you have these all ticked, you will still export this analytical construction set here. So you need to make sure the overrides are unticked. So I'll just OK that. And I'll just hit Next. And just save the file.
So if we now go into the virtual environment, click on the import GBXML file, click on import, and source the XML file and click open. Now we can obviously put that in a suitable location. And save that file. Anytime you import an XML file, you will get this BIM report. And you at this point you can check your shell import settings as discussed at the start of the broadcast. And you can also check what the raw geometry has come in like and what the IES algorithms have done to tidy up the geometry. So you can see the, the raw geometry as it came in. There was a few spaces that had unbound volumes, so they had holes in them. And once the algor IES algorithms were uh, per performed on these spaces, they're now fully bound volumes, as you can see here. There's also a couple of other spaces that actually had the surface orientation in the wrong direction, which, as we uh, pointed out earlier, this is vital for thermal analysis. So you can save this report for a later date. And this, today I'm just going to close that off and I'm just going to click OK. So we've imported a model. We can have a quick look in the front view. Have a look at axonometry. It looks fine. It's always good to have a good visual check of your model. And we'll just open up the model viewer and have a quick look at it in there. Just check everything's OK there. So close that off. So if I now go into Apache and just say yes, I'll isolate the ground floor, select the rooms and go into Assign Constructions. If I click on Internal Partitions, we can see here we've got our IES Partition 1 and you can see in the dialog on the left hand side where it's located within the model. So you can see you could go through and isolate constructions, or sorry, tag constructions, so that you don't have to go and hunt them out throughout your model. They'll be listed in here as you've defined them within your Revit model. So if we now we'll go back and we can look at what other data you can import. Some of the inform other information that comes across uh, when you're using the, the XML is uh, if you're using Revit architecture you can bring across location, building type and uh, your room volumes with your uh, geometry names um, and you can also bring across constructions. The With Revit MEP you can bring across location, building type, room volumes, occupancy, electrical lighting loads power density and also constructions. With this, um, with your workflows you, to look at, the other key thing is what you can do as well as just bringing across this information, you might decide just to bring across your geometry and again John will cover more detail on this. Um, you can bring across the geometry and use third party softwares to link and be a good go between between the two pieces of software. So again in this case Revit Architecture or Revit MEP. So you can start to push information between the, the two. As I say Jean will touch on this more. So what we'll, we're going to do now is just um, go through a, a video that uh, will demonstrate the taking information across to the virtual environment then using, uh, running some calculations and taking the results back to the VE, uh, to Revit, sorry. In this short video, we're going to look at how to export a model from Revit to the virtual environment, run the steady state heating cooling loads, and export the results from these calculations back into Revit. The 
first point we need to look at is where the data is held within Revit. To do this, select a space within your model and look at the properties dialog. Next, we will export our model to the VE via a GBXML file. Now we need to create a space schedule within Revit. We will use this to synchronise the space data between Revit and the VE via Excel. In this demonstration, a plugin for Revit called RF Tools is utilised. Once you've created your space schedule, go to the RF Tools tab within Revit, select the Spaces option from the Filter tab, go to the Excel tab, select the Revit Schedules option and select the space schedule you've created already. Click Export. This will launch Excel. And you can see your schedule there. Take care at this point to remove any erroneous spaces from your schedule. Now we're going to import our GBXML file into the virtual environment. We can check our BIM report just to check the geometry is OK. Now that we're in the VE, if we go to Apache, click on our Sibsy Lobes tab and run our steady state calculations. From here, click on Apache and then click on our tabular room data. From this tab, we will find the results from our calculations. So we can export this back into Excel. On this tab, there's quite a lot of data. So we're just going to hide the data that we're not interested in at this point. We're also going to sort this data so that it matches up with the room schedule from Revit. This can be done here in Excel or back in Tab Edit. Once this is done, we can then copy and paste our heating and cooling loads into our Revit schedule. Save this, open up Revit again, and from the RF tab, import your room schedule. That also has the room data from the calculations within the virtual environment. And that's you. You have your heating and cooling loads back in your Revit model. We can check this on a room-by-room -room basis if you want by selecting a space from your model. 